Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jerry Hull. I'm with GoSeed. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Rob Myers for helping us put on this presentation. I'd like to thank the uh, panelists. We've got, we'll start from the end. We've got John Burke representing the uh, North East, or the Midwest region. Doug Poole, who's the Northwest region. We've got uh, Jimmy Emmons hiding back there. I can barely see him. He's with the Southern region. And then we've got Don Branton here from the Northeast. Uh, one, one of the things we want to talk about is to let you know what you can get out of these cover crop councils. Some of them are newer than others. Some have been around for some time, but there's a lot of benefits. So thank you for coming and attending. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Grassland Oregon, Go Seeds. Uh, we started this company about 20 years ago, and one of the things when we started it, we thought it was very important to, as our mission statement, we got the tagline, uh, providing novel solutions for growing concerns. And cover crops was one of those things. So we started putting energy into developing novel products to help uh, make agricultural more sustainable. Our first focus was on nitrogen fixing legumes. We looked at what our agricultural forefathers had done and we thought we can uh, use our skills, our knowledge of plant genetics to build on this and make this practice relevant again. We then started turning our focus to problematic nematodes and lately we've been working on optimizing plants with microbial populations so we can increase those populations of good beneficial microbes. So I appreciate you all coming here. One of the things, um, it's our goal that we want to develop products that are going to make your farm more profitable. It is our hope that our products that we develop are going to make your farms more sustainable. And it's our dream that by working together, we can leave our resource, soil, in better condition than we found it. So with that being said, I'll be answering, uh, taking the mic around, and I'm going to turn it over to Rob. Thank you, Jerry. Can you hear me okay? Great. Well, we're very glad to uh, be with you here today, and we want to make this session fairly interactive. What we're going to do is start off with a couple general questions for the farmer panel. All these gentlemen have been working with cover crops for quite a few years in their respective regions of the country. And just to kind of make sure we got some different uh, cropping systems represented, uh, we wanted to pull people in from four regions. So just to better introduce you to how they're using cover crops, we're going to start off with a question about that. So I know all of you have used cover crops for at least several years now, but Tell us a little bit about your farm, where you're at in terms of your state, and uh, how you got started with cover crops and which cover crops you're using now. So Don, we'll go first with you. Yeah, I'm Donnie Branton from uh, Western New York, up between Rochester and Buffalo. And I'm proud to say I'm 65 years old now and signed up. But uh, our farm operation consists of approximately 1,500 acres. We do also do some custom harvesting and some custom planning for some of the neighboring farms around when and if it fits into our operation. Uh, we grow grain crops, corn, soybeans, wheat, oats, cereal rye. We do have some processing vegetables in the operation. We grow some lima beans, some sweet corn, some peas. We have grown some snap beans. We have alfalfa in a rotation also, neighboring dairy farm. We seed the alfalfa down and then we rent the ground to them, typically on a three-year three -year situation or lease, uh, sometimes extendable up to five years when you're going into the fifth year and say, do we terminate it or not? And they say, that's the best stand we've been cutting, so we leave it down. But uh, my, my beginning in cover crops, knowing I was coming to the session, I thought back years ago and I got involved with cover crops unbeknownst that they were cover crops in the true essence 46 years ago. Used to work for a fertilizer and chemical dealer and my job in the spring for frost seeding was to go out and frost seed clover. We had a six wheeled Argo utility vehicle. We had 12 volt cedar mounted on the back and I know the, one, the biggest year I did was over 1200 acres with that. So I would get up about 4.30 in the morning, look out the window and see what the weather was and if it was calm. And, and froze up enough to go, I would go, and if the wind was blowing too hard, I'd go back to bed for a while. But uh, we, st we started with a reduced till a number of years ago, thinking that was gonna help our soil health immensely. It did help with reduced till, but we did not incorporate cover crops to the extent that we are today. Today, we're trying to use multi-species cover crops 
when and where they'll fit in. We've got about 170 acres of what you call bio strip till that we did this last year. We configured our no-till 40-foot drill with a Velmar air seeder system and configured it so we could plant different species in alternating rows so that the non-overwintering species will be in what will be the corn row for this year. Overwintering species will be behind it. Uh, promoting cover crops as much and as best as we can because we see the value in it. Early on with uh, frost seeded medium red clover where we would have corn following it, we were able to document in the early years that the clover was contributing 50% of the nitrogen to our corn production when we compared production and application of nitrogen on those fields versus fields that did not have clover on it. So I was pretty excited at that. Uh, our, our typical nitrogen application is in the three quarters of a pound purchase nitrogen per year. Cereal rye is always our go-to crop late in the season. We'll, we'll seed it as late as we can get the drill in the ground and uh, it'll, it'll come up by next spring if, if not the latest. But uh, this past year we had terrible weather conditions and we basically got <coughs> almost zero cover crop in. Uh, like I said earlier, the multi-species crops we like to use in the summer after our wheat or oats, sometimes after the sweet corn. Uh, processing peas, when we grow them, we'll typically follow that with either winter wheat or a summer seeding of alfalfa. If we're going to a summer, summer seeding of alfalfa, that will be drilled almost immediately after the peas are harvested, no-till drilled. The winter wheat, that'll be planted later in September. So that situation, what we would do is put what we would call a short-term cover crop in or intermediate cover crop to bridge the link between pea harvest and wheat planting time. We like to plant green. We've planted wheat green. We've planted corn green, soybeans green. I planted sweet corn green years ago when I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I planted it and people said, what are you doing? Well, I needed to plant the corn and yeah, there were some oats growing out there, but I'll take care of those later. But right now, we presently grow all non-GMO corn and beans. We've had good luck with it, but uh, Thanks, Dan. I'll, I'll stop okay. there. <laughs> Thank you, Don. <laughs> Thanks, All right, Rob. we're going to go next with uh, Jimmy Emmons from Oklahoma. So, Jimmy? Yeah, I live uh, in northwest Oklahoma, about two hours, two hours and a half northwest of Oklahoma City. Uh, so we're in about a 20-inch rainfall, give or take 20 inches. Seems like in the last uh, few years it could be we had 20 inches in the month of May in 2014, and we've been as low as six. So it's uh, been pretty extreme, and uh, I started no-tilling in 1995 and, and working uh, towards where I'm at today with that, uh, I just couldn't get it to work in continuous wheat. Of course, then I didn't know about cover crops and, and if I'd been better doing what I was doing then, I'd be a lot further down the road. Uh, and eight years ago, I made the commitment to really get serious about soil health and cover crops. And so we started small and then side by side comparisons to try to, to uh, convince ourselves that it would work and it, and it did and so we went from basically two crops to we've got ten crops in the rotation now and we balance them crops with the, the amount of carbon that we can put in the ground uh, is how we go about the rotation and so it's uh, it's been very good process for us uh, we're, we're growing rye and barley and wheat country now that, that some of my neighbors really don't think that's the thing to do uh, but that's the interesting point for them to discuss at the coffee shop and and we kind of enjoy that but you know we've come a long ways of, of what we're doing we've had about 2,000 acres in our uh, system of different cover crops where we use warm species in the summer and then we'll use cool seasons behind our peas and our beans and stuff like that and we'll plant just as late as we can just like Don uh, matter of fact we just planted some uh, a week or two ago because of the weather's been so extreme at home and so wet and, and of course that always stirs up a lot of, of coffee shop talk too uh, but with that I mean we also use our cover crops as grazing crops too I am a rancher too right? we're about three times as many acres of, of rangeland as we do uh, production land so I have the option to put animals in the system which has really helped us down the road 
So, you know, we see a, a huge benefit from the animals. We see a huge benefit from the cover crops from where we used to be and how our organic matter is coming up, our infiltration rates are going up, so that when we do get them big rains, we can get in the ground instead of running it off. So uh, lots more we can talk about, but that will kind of give you the basics of, of where I'm at in Oklahoma. So, Jimmy, that's a good transition to Douglas because we're kind of going from wetter to drier as we go the first three farmers here. So you're probably in a 40-inch rainfall yeah. area yeah. and 20-inch. And now we're going to go to how many inches where you're at? Seven to nine. <laughs> Seven to nine inches. So Douglas Pool, Eastern Washington. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, we, we farm in uh, seven to nine inches, not 79. Uh, <laughs> seven to nine inches of rain a year, mostly uh, winter uh, moisture. Uh, right now I've got a foot of snow, uh, but the ground's froze. We're not going to see any of that moisture. So anyway, we farm in an area where the glacier decided that it was going to stop. Uh, from a, a majority of my fields, I can see where that stopped. I have no idea why my family didn't go another 21 miles and farm somewhere where there isn't a rock, but they didn't. And so much of my soil is anywhere from a foot to three feet deep. Um, so I, when I came back to the farm, um, I had left for a number of years to become an accountant. I came back to the farm and there were several fields we don't farm anymore. We had farmed them down to nothing, literally farmed it down to bedrock and basalt rock. And so it was at that time I said, well, geez, we've got we've to take the farm to no-till and at that same time, uh, our local NRCS uh, agent, she was awesome. She got us, a number of us into no-till, and she took us to Ray Archuleta. We got a kind of a one-on-one -on -one with Ray uh, in a small town, about 20 of us. And I left there. It was it, I mean, that was the selling point. We, we had to be there. And so, of course, you, you leave a meeting like that with seven inches of rain, you have to figure out what you're going to do. So in my area, where we were predominantly wheat uh, fallow. Uh, everything right now is still fallow. Um, I've now expanded into canola, sunflowers. Uh, we even grew some corn this year uh, on that rainfall. And then we started implementing the cover crops. And the only reason I did the cover crops was as Ray said, well, you know what, put a seed in the ground for 30 days. That's all you need. And that's really what got us going. But now listening to guys like Jimmy and, and some of the other ones that I follow, uh, we're trying to get rid of fallow. I, I, I no longer want fallow in my system and cover crops are going to be the way to do it. In, in that system, we also have the good fortune of having livestock. And so I, I, we're going to take, in our area, we're going to take that, that cropland out of production. And, uh, you know, my, in my area, wheat's $5, and it's going to stay $5 for the foreseeable future. I think I can put way more weight on a, on a cow and haul it off in a truck than to cross the scale with the crop, with the cover crops. So. So we're, we're, we're new. I'm obviously probably the newest of the, of the group up here. But in the end, I think my guiding light is soil health. I, I've got to figure out how to have a living root at all times as long as I can and then figure out how to haul that off in a cow. So, John, you're back further east again, but probably a range of soil types. So tell us about your farm. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, got a cold. Um, yeah, I'm Johnny Burke. I'm from Bay City, Michigan, and our farm up there by the Saginaw Bay, kind of in the bottom of our thumb, we can all use our hand. Uh, our soil type is heavy clay, Londo series, tap and loam soils. We do have some sands. Uh, our soil depth is typically about 8 to 10 inches deep, so compaction is huge for us up there. Now, we farm about 4,000 acres of corn, soybeans, sugar beets, and winter wheat. And we started cover crops back in 1999. And the reason we did that was we were having issues with the sugar beet cyst nematode, and we found there was a radish that would help eliminate or reduce um, the sugar beet cyst nematodes in the soils. So we started looking at planting the uh, radishes after the wheat crop. From there, it trans we transitioned into using um, winter peas along with those radishes to help give some nitrogen to the uh, radishes so they would grow faster and get a little larger tap roots and that was working really well. Well then we decided to take it a step farther after the sugar beets would come off we got all this bare soil on this out there so we started using cereal rye at that point to put some ground cover out there so that soil wouldn't blow but also to help reduce some of the compaction. Some of the issues we have when you take sugar beets out we can't really follow with radishes because we're so far into the fall they usually germinate, they get an inch high and die. We don't have a very large window to plant radishes once we start harvesting sugar beets and corn in Michigan. So that's why we went with rye. 
Well, then one winter I'm sitting there in my house. I bought a house out in the middle of a farm field. It's really interesting. You can watch a lot of things go on in your field when you live right in the middle of it. So I'm sitting there watching the soil blow by my window every day. <laughs> and finally I said, that's enough of this. And after that, every soybean acre that didn't get planted to wheat had cereal rye put on it, along with our sugar beet ground. I don't like watching the soil blow away. We started that about 10 years ago. Yes, it's difficult to control cereal rye sometimes. We're trying to grow about 1,000 acres of it, it seems like. But once, with a 120-foot boom, it's easy. It don't take that long to spray it. A lot of times, we're lucky. We can just go in and till it and work it and plant it, and we'll spray it out later. That's the ideal way to do it. But you always get caught in the rain. Sometimes the rye gets away on you, but it's not every field. There's enough tillage tools out there that we can work that rye down somehow once you get it killed. And we had some soybeans one year. We had a field we were able to plant at first part of April. They went 90 bushel. And then we had one field down the road that we didn't get the rye killed or worked until six weeks later. And the yield difference was only four bushels. But we had three foot tracks from one end to the other trying to kill that rye. And then we're out there with a disc floating it across trying to get it to dry out. And you swore nothing would ever grow. I'm just glad it was on a back road. But when you see the yields, it really turns out that rye is very forgiving on the soil when you, when you muck it up because you've got more organic matter going in the soil, you've got that root structure. The other thing we also started using is spring barley because that winter kills and for untiled ground that we don't want to put rye on that might get away on us, spring barley is a great option in Michigan, especially if you can get it planted before the first of October, we can get great growth out of it and we can also mix some radishes in with it as well. So, we like to work all our seeds in. I don't like just spreading them on top. If we have a dry fall, they typically don't germinate real well. You've got to have rain to get them to come up. So that's why we chisel plow our seeds in, or else we'll disc rip them in, depending on what the soil type is for that field. And I guess with that, we'll turn it back over to Rob. Okay, thanks, John. So you've got a variety of expertise up here with cover crops, but part of what we wanted to do today, in addition to taking some questions from you about cover crops, is to let you know a little bit more about the regional cover crop councils. Some of you from the Midwest may have heard of the one that's called the Midwest Cover Crop Council, but if you haven't, uh, these councils have kind of formed at different time points, and they're all voluntary groups of people, farmers, university extension, researchers, NRCS, that have kind of come together to share information on cover crops. So it's, it's totally kind of a nonprofit volunteer effort. Um, it's a group effort that occurs through four different regions of the U.S. So the Midwest group's been around for about 10 years, the Southern and Northeastern groups for about three years now, and the Western group is just, just getting organized here over the last year, but is now <laughs> getting up and running. So with the slight exception of the West, all of these councils have websites, and they all have uh, periodic meetings. Most of them are holding annual meetings. I think the Southern region's been doing every other year. But I wanted to ask these fellows just briefly what value you found your regional cover crop council. And then at that point, we'll open it up to the audience for questions about any cover crop topic you want to bring up. So Don, you're actually on the board of the Northeast Cover Crop Council. Yep. Just briefly, what information has been helpful to you working with that council? Well, I can't honestly say that I myself have received useful information out of it. Uh, my interest getting involved with it was because I felt that they needed to have somebody with their boots on the ground and were doing these things. When we, when we first talked about the Cover Crop Council and then the, then the Board of Directors and the Executive Board, I looked around the people that were, were up for trying to fill some of these positions and there was not very many that were what, what you call N. NGO, so we need the farmer input. That's a good so point. We want farmers have, involved yeah, to provide that input. I to make sure we had the farmer input. Yep. And part of the mission is it's on result-based information. You know, that's what we want to make sure that we're trying to promote things that work. Uh, the Northeast Cover Crop Council covers from West Virginia up to Connecticut. I did talk about extending the boundaries up into Ontario and the Quebec area because they do a lot of work up there. But uh, yes, we're open to input from them, but I think for for funding, funding reasons, 
you can't actually say that it's an international <laughs> well, organization. Actually, right we do, and the Midwest Cover Crop Council have does, some Ontario have, farmers yes. and folks involved. So, so John, you're not too far from Ontario no. there in Michigan. What, what's what been helpful to you to connect with the Cover Crop Council? Well, what I found with the Cover Crop Council was I was searching for something to winter kill besides the radish, but yet I needed something that would be longevity within you know our growing time frame. Because, I mean, we can use oats. I knew about oats, but the problem with the oats is we can't get enough growth out of it before it winter kills in Michigan, where that's where I was turned on to the spring barley was one of the talks I was having with the Cover Crop Council, that that would sustain a lot colder temperatures. So that's why we started using that then, and that's helped tremendous, because sometimes we're now allowed to grow or harvest our sugar beets in August. Well, if I plant cereal rye in August, it's going to be a jungle come spring. I need to plant something else, otherwise it gets away on me, and that was a great fit for the spring barley, because if that heads out, which it did on us the one year, it just pul it breaks up into nothing. It's just pul it just pulverizes. It's the most mellowest ground we ever had to plant into. So that was a great asset was finding out about the spring barley. So, and I want to just be clear: you're actually planting the spring barley not in the spring, but in the fall. In the fall, we spread it. We just bulk okay. spread it, and we'll chisel plow it in. Usually, is what we do. Yep. Just to get a little seed soil contact to it, so it'll germinate. Yep. And Jimmy, I know you've been involved with the Southern Cover Crop Council. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, I got invited to be a part of that as, as inception, part of being a farmer. And uh, we're just getting ready to host our first uh, meeting in July in Auburn. Uh, and early on, you know, for, for me, I wanted to make sure that the farmer input was naturally there. Uh, we got to have everybody's input, but I want to make sure that, that, that we were heard. And so I was part of about four different farmers in that in that role building it uh, and it's really helped me uh, see more of the region even though I do travel quite a bit I, I get to this is really really personal one-on-one uh, -on -one with uh, producers across the country which has really been helpful uh, to me and so as I see that as a great benefit I've been really pushing the group to get that information put together and get that out uh, because early on I didn't have anyone to to bounce ideas off of, and, and I think that's a really a critical part of anything we're trying to do that's out of the norm. Yep. I mean, we all know how to do the norm, and so you know you got to have a little moral support and also someone with creative ideas that that maybe I hadn't thought about. So that's uh, been a, a big benefit for us, and we're just we're not quite as new as as Douglas is, but we're we're still pretty new, and, and we're just trying to get everything to get got the website up now and and uh, all the profiles, and I am on the executive board this year. Uh, so it's been a fun experience thus far. Yep. And Douglas, since the Western Cover Crop Council is just getting going, what are your hopes as a farmer for what a group like that can do in terms of helping you with your cover crops? I suppose the easiest way to answer that is, is just to dovetail off of everything, ever, everything that's already been said. In my experience with where my successes have come from, have really been farmer to farmer uh, led. In our little group meetings uh, in my area, amazingly enough, the coffee hour has changed to no-till and crops or cover crops and to uh, livestock integration. That's it's probably unheard of in a lot of areas. A lot of times, I think the coffee shop is laughing at people <laughs> like us, but in our area, we're pretty lucky. And so, I'm attracted to that farmer to farmer uh, input and uh, I, anything that I can be part of to basically to plagiarize. I. I just turned 50 and I'm thinking I'm not going to do this the rest of my life and I want to see something now and if somebody's already done it then why do I need to recreate the wheel? Sounds good. Well before we take your questions from the audience I want to tell you that these gentlemen will be available just outside the uh, floor area here right after the session which ends at 2.30 and then uh, after a little while we're going to kind of transition down to the Grassland Oregon booth which is number 1158, 1158, which is just like a third of the way down the aisle there. So uh, they'll be available for the next hour or two to answer individual questions you have. But let's go ahead and take some questions from the audience. So Jerry's got a microphone over here. What questions do you have for these folks? Two questions. Two questions, not necessarily related. Uh, one of you said you, there was four farmers on the uh, council, and it sounded as though there was a group of non-farmers that you were talking to. Is that true or not? Secondly, what was your organic matter content that you were concerned about when you started, and what has it gotten to after a few years? 
So oh, yes, okay. I, I am one of the. Just, just a second. So they may have a little heart trouble hearing the question. So the question was about the farmer involvement with the councils. Who else is involved? And then about organic matter. Go ahead, Jimmy. So yes, we have a lot of academia from uh, different schools in that area, as well as extension and other other entities that's that's helping build that. But we are four of us that originally agreed to do it uh, voluntarily to step on with that. Uh, I have some land that when I started uh, was anywhere from three to four tenths of a percent. And now that, that field, I, I had none below one percent and I have areas that I'm just now getting up to three. Of course, them areas weren't uh, down to that four tenths when I started, they were a little higher. So. We are gaining ground in eight years at, at a pretty significant rate, but we've done that with cover crops, cattle, and cash crops. So I always plant a cover crop behind whatever I harvest, regardless. And, and this year was extremely difficult because we were in a huge drought. We went 10 months with like six inches of rain, almost his yearly rainfall. But for us, that's pretty short. Then we got all our rain in the six weeks and we wound up above our average by about eight inches. So that, that, that organic matter being able to be a lot higher than I was eight years ago, I really able to catch that rain and store it for the next, next round. But I did have rye that laid in the ground 130 days uh, last spring before it germinated. But we had a wildfire and I thought it was a huge, huge disaster with that rye laying in the ground, but it had come up and was about this tall when we had the wildfire and I actually saved my cow herd being able to put them in on the green. So John, you've been doing this a long time. What kind of organic matter changes have you seen? Well, what I've seen is when we first went back with the soil consultant about 15 years ago, our percentage levels are right around 3% typically on our farms. But if you went back and tracked it over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. 10 to 15, we've gained between three quarters and one and a quarter percent organic matter we've gained since then. When we go back to 99, when we first started using them radishes, we used to deep till a lot of soil, which we still do, to break up the compaction. And when we'd break up them compaction zones, I mean, we just had great big, huge chunks of soil. We don't have, we haven't had that in five, 10 years. It just, if it does, once in a great while in a headland, you may get that but it's not like it used to be. In our water, we've noticed too, we don't have the big ponds sitting out in the fields anymore like we used to. Our soil tilth has changed dramatically. Do you wanna, Douglas, you're kinda new to this, so kinda you probably new. haven't seen too much change yet. But not, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. Right over here. I would share real quick. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So where I've had the cover crops, I, once we started no-till, even with my monoculture wheat and canola, we were having what they call, especially in the canola, J-hooking. And everybody said, oh, it's a hard pan. It, I don't believe it's a hard pan. I think it was an anhydrous pan uh, from 60 years of straight up anhydrous. What I've found with the cover crops is, is that pan just explodes. There's no more such things. No, no J-hooking when those, that, I only use a five-way mix because I, I, we don't have enough moisture to support anything else and it just decimates that hard pan. And for me, all of a sudden I have access to moisture, and again, in seven to nine inches, anything I can get to is, is yeah, gravy. We, we hear that a lot, deeper rooting with the cover crops. Uh, John, you mentioned you tried to reduce nematodes and sugar beets. Yes, we were and trying. Then, did you also try soybean cyst nematodes? And soybean? The radish. So the question was about nematodes, in case everybody couldn't hear it. Go ahead, John. The radish, we were using for sugar, the oilseed radish only works on the sugar beet cyst nematode. It does not eliminate the populations, but it reduces them greatly. Uh, there has been some work done, and I think I read that through some of the work the Cover Crop Council's been doing on using cereal rye to reduce nematodes in soybeans. So the, uh, the question about soybean cyst nematode, so, so John is right, they kind of vary in their activity depending on the nematode type, but the Soybean cyst nematode will not live in a lot of the brassica plants, and so it's not so much killing them, it's just not providing them a food source. So by using a radish, uh, then you can kind of reduce the population of the nematodes. It's not gonna get rid of them completely, but it can have some benefit. 
and I can add on a little bit of that, Rob, that nematode controlling radishes, they'll affect uh, uh, Columbia root knot nematodes, they'll affect the sugar beet cyst nematodes, and some northern root knot nematodes. Uh, and that's about where it's at at this point. Next question. First of all, I'd like to thank Successful Farming for making this session available to, to the Commodity Classic group. I think with the whole cover crop um, momentum that we got going right now, it's very important because of what we're seeing in our lakes and our rivers and our streams, how important it is, is to keep the nutrients in our soils recycle the nutrients and keep them from getting into our our water and creating an, an issue that we don't want to have to deal with. Yeah, good point. John, I know you've talked about being close to one of the Great Lakes, that that's kind of an issue that you think about when you're doing your management practices. Well, yes, we're right along the Saginaw Bay watershed where we farm, and there are a lot of issues there. Which with is part of Lake Erie, right? We're, no, or, uh, well, it's above, we're above Lake Erie. Okay. Probably couple hundred miles north okay where Lake Erie would start but we're in the Lake Huron is what we're in Huron okay in the southern tip of it so we have a lot of government funding not just at a federal level but also at a local level to help farmers get started with using some sort of a cover crop or reducing fertilizer and pesticide usage in that area and it's way easier to go through one of these programs before it becomes mandated by someone else yep okay yes. Okay, John, a uh, question for you, John. Um, I noticed, over here, okay. I noticed uh, that you incorporate a lot of tillage in your system yet, and you mentioned that your, your soil structure is improving greatly. Have you ever considered going to, to no-till in the, in the system? We have, the only problem we have with the no-till is our soils are too heavy, and with being by the bay, we have so many cool nights and cool mornings, and wet and damp, the ground never really dries out real well. I have a cousin that he does no-till everything, and he's now incorporating a few cover crops into the system, and he's struggling to get 150 bushel corn, where we can pull 180, 250, no problem. And he, you know, the tillage, yes, it costs money, yes, it's burning fuel, but, in, but with our sh short soil depth, it, we need to incorporate that back into our soil. So it is true, certainly, depending on where you're at, that the tillage is different. So, Don, you've actually used both no-till and strip-till. Yep. Talk a little bit yeah. about how you've approached tillage on your farm. We try to reduce it all we can, but uh, I started, started zone-tilling and no-tilling back in 88. And, uh, yeah, that first year I did on a three-acre field that if you had an airplane, you could see it. Otherwise, you didn't see it. I was really impressed with the results. So I gradually expanded my use of no-till from there f till 1996. And uh, it, was, it was a little more difficult then to try to expand your, your modifications to planters because there wasn't that much information out there. There wasn't that many companies doing things. But uh, we kept pecking away at it. 96, we went to zone till and uh, so that's sort of a strip till system? Yeah, the zone till is kind of a strip till setup. It's a three colder setup uh, mounted in front of your planter that does a little tillage in front of the row unit. We had it set up to put some nutrients on. And for three years, we split quite a few of our fields, grain corn, sweet corn, soybeans, because for three years, I felt I had to prove it to myself. After the third year, I said basically the hell with that, I know what works, and it wasn't the tillage, that every year the reduced till out, outperformed the tillage operation, so we sold our moldboard plow. Uh, we were, at that time when we were planting our veg crops and our grain crops, when I started with a no-till early on, it was just on grain corn, because the apprehension of what effect it would have on other crops. I said if I can make it work in that, I'll try it on other crops. In 96 was when I started doing it on sweet corn. The Cannon factory told me, basically, they did not embrace it, but they said, don't tell us and we won't ask, as long <laughs> as we can get a quality product. 
Then in 99, we started no-tilling some peas. True no-tilling peas, again, the same response. We won't embrace it, but we won't ask and don't tell as long as we get a quality product. Um, 2004, we bought our first true strip-till unit that ran a shank and some colders. The reason we went to that, that type of setup was because, as I started to say earlier, planting some of our crops late was the with the snap beans, the sweet corn, getting up into the latter part of July, ground was getting quite hard and dried out. I've had weight brackets and fertilizer hopper extensions on my planter. I had so much iron on it that the, uh, the field, field rep from Kinsey Manufacturing itself was out at a summer field day and came to look at my planter and he said, I don't know how the hell it stands up with all that weight on it, but we had to add all that weight to penetrate the ground, so that's why in 2004 we bought one of the first strip till units in the area, set it up with nutrient application, again split some fields. We had a summer field day, we had Francis Childs out that summer, we had Ray Ross in it the summer field day, we dug some root pits, we did a three year study with Cornell on the nitrogen placement, putting it down shallow, putting it up. up in the top two inch zone and for a three year period, the deep place nitrogen was a strip till unit, outperformed any other method of application. So now you said the ground was hard when you first started no-till yes, quite a few years ago. Now yes. you've used cover crops, do you find it's, they make the no-till ground yes, more mellow? I, I was truly a disbeliever. I've been to the National No-Till Conference I think 13 times now over the years and talking with growers from different parts of the country, some of them in Ohio, and they're saying they're taking all their no-till components off their planter, we don't need them anymore. I said, ain't no way in hell I can do that. Well, now I'm finding, I'm eating those words. Some of our ground, yes, we don't need all those attachments anymore. More so the attachments may be used for nutrient application. We try to band all our nutrients, we've seen huge Huge response from that, uh, reduced input cost. We can cut, cut our for applications back by banding the nutrients, getting more efficiency out of it. Microbial activity is ramping up, so we're getting better, better use out of our nutrients that are in the soil, tied up in the soil. And I, I think, I don't have scientific proof, I'm not college educated, but I think some of, the, some of the obstacle of increasing organic matter, even with cover crops, is as you build up your soil biological activity, make your soil more active, that they're feeding on the organic matter residue in the ground. Uh, when we were zone tilling corn, grain corn, into a clover cover crop that was knee high tall, by August, you could not find a stitch of clover out there. And we asked ourselves, where the hell did it go? And you see all those earthworm middens. It's amazing what earthworms can do for the soil, that they can turn that, turn that crop matter into organic matter, nutrients, make it available, you know, water infiltration. John, you've I, said that too, right? More earthworms where you're using yes. cover crops? That was the one thing we've seen too. It seemed like for a few years there, we didn't even see an earthworm. The seagulls never showed up to eat them because there weren't any. <laughs> but now we do have a, a lot of earthworm activity. You see them quite prevalently. And I think that's why we got all those little channels now from the earthworms. Plus they're chewing up all that organic matter and spitting it back out. They're digesting that. So yeah, it breaks down a lot faster when it's tilled in the soil. And that was the other thing we noticed with my cousin's no-till. His organic matter, I mean, the corn stubble, soybean stubble, it was all the same as it was in the fall, come spring. And I've been on farms in Indiana where they got everything working just right. That stuff is gone. It's just level. Yeah, it's right a really microbes. interesting thing we're seeing is you hear people concerned, well, I've got too much corn residue. I can't do this minimum tillage or cover crops. We're finding the cover crops actually help break down the corn residue faster, right? Yeah, yeah, we seen that early on that we were scared to death of the amount of residue we were getting. And now, now we can't grow enough yeah. uh, because our activity is getting so so alive, and so it so our more, soil more active cycling yeah. of those nutrients. Okay, we got another question here. Hey, Jimmy, uh, with your grazing livestock and integrating your warm season cover crops, what level of profitability have you been able to achieve? 
And how are you grazing those livestock, your cows out across those acres? So you asked me, if you did hear that, how we manage our warm season cover crops uh, in our grazing system. So we've done several studies with that, and we can, in about a 60-day period, we can take anywhere from 115 to $200 an acre, depends on the price of cattle, but we always see at least three pounds a day gain, and we have seen up, you know, four and a half, uh, depending on the animals and, and the condition and everything, of course. So that really can uh, add to that profitability, and we're using poly wire to move them. So uh, we were scared to death of that process early on, too, because we'd never, we just never had done that, so we're out of our comfort zone. So we started with 11 to 15 acre paddocks and uh, moving on three days and, and now we're down we move several times a day or every day uh, depending on where I'm at and what we're doing but if you really want to ramp up your your biology and get that system going uh, pile them animals up and, and you'll see that just make a significant turn uh, straight up almost in that and add a lot of profit but I've got animals but I've got neighbors uh, that don't have animals now that are taking animals in, uh, and so that's working very well. But it's an integral, uh, important piece uh, to our profitability now. Jimmy, quick follow-up. I, I hear farmers say, well, I don't think I can bother grazing cattle because I took down all my permanent fencing years ago, but you made the point about polywire. I hear this over and over. You get the cattle trained you can get by with that single wire, especially if you're moving them every so often. Sure, I, it's, it's easy for us to put out a half mile of wire and pick up a half mile in about 20 minutes. We're, we're set up on a four wheeler ATV uh, with electric drill, roll things up, you just drive along, step in post. It's, it's just re revolutionized how, how we do it. Like we were scared to death early on the amount of work putting up fencing and stuff and that's, that's not an issue. Uh, so anymore. maybe 20 minutes a day you're... Yeah, I mean, we'll have anywhere from 100 to 200 head of cattle grazing warm seasons. I can spend, oh, maybe 30 to 40 minutes a day moving them. Uh -huh. So it's, it's pretty easy. Infrastructures uh, have depleted across the whole country, and everybody's uh, big concern is water. Yep. And... We've been doing some studies with Richard Teague, uh, Dr. Richard Teague out at Texas A&M. Uh, we're actually working on a system where we move water with portable and not have to set up so much poly wire because you can actually train an animal uh, to stay close to water uh, and it, you can't quite confine them like with a wire, but they're just like us. They won't walk any further than they have to and if they know you're gonna move water daily, they'll just circle around that yeah. So we're doing some of that too. Okay, we got probably got time for one more. Surely we haven't answered all of them. <laughs> Hi, a question. Um, have any of you guys experimented with different mixes of cover crops? And also, um, where are you getting your cover crops? Are you getting them from specialty cover crop seed companies or from your regular retailer? We'll just do this real fast. Okay. John, what mixes I, and where do you get them? I use, uh, sometimes we're doing peas, radish, and red clover. Sometimes it's just a peas, radish mix. And as far as getting the seed, there's a lot of dealers out there that are seed companies that handle the seed, and I eat a dealer myself. So there's a lot of places you can find it. You just have to look it up online. Would you say it's mostly cover crop specialty companies you're working with, or is it some of the bigger seed companies it's too? It's some of the bigger ones as well have it. It's not necessarily a specialty company. There's other larger companies that would have the seed as well. Uh, rye, you can use year from cert uh, year from grown. You don't necessarily have to buy certified seed for a lot of this stuff. Okay, uh, Douglas? Yeah, I, I, I grow my own, so I try to grow some of my own triticale, the canola, the sunflowers. I'll throw that in my mix. I work with specialty companies. I work with the local grain company. Um, any, anywhere I can get my hands on it that's cheap. So our summer mixes range anywhere from 15 species up to about 32. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out that all out. It's all targeted uh, on the carbon and what, what we want our cover crop to do. Uh, since we got started, now we're growing a lot of seed for companies. Uh, so then we have access to seed. And so we'll do a lot of the, the, the bigger seeds and then we'll bring in the specialty seeds and mix that with us. Now our cool seasons, uh, that, that's a different 
bear to, to when you're starting about mixes uh, because the closer you get to winter, it's it's hard to get the brassicas to grow in a cooler season. It's harder to get the legumes up and going. Uh, now we'll do that. We'll we'll plant some early, and we'll have about anywhere from three to four or five uh, species in with the rye. But the later we go, the bigger the challenge is to get it. Uh, but rye and barley, we, we raise. Uh, winter barley as well as spring barley now in, in the system and so all that and actually we're doing some work with Noble Research on winter oats uh, and, and we've been in that about four years and we're trying to develop a variety that will stand at 10 below zero and above and, and we're just about there. And we're, you get seed from places like green cover seed? And yes, other green, green cover seed. There, there's a few places around us but actually green cover is probably the most knowledgeable in our area. Uh, for that, but there's Out everybody's the learning. Yeah. How about you, Don? Where do you get your seed? We get our seed from Seedway, Agriculver. There's again, there's a lot of places now that handle handle different cover crop seeds. A lot of the seed suppliers are getting, if you want to say, getting on the bandwagon. They see the market emerging, so they're trying to get in on it. But we we'll plant up as much as 12 different species so far right now. We try to do a balancing act. You have to look at your seeding rate. You have to look at your seeds per pound and the dollar, dollar implication. We generally try to target that $30, $35 an acre rate for our cover crop seed and try to balance the seeds for, you know, your mycorrhizal fungi activity. Some have it, some don't. Uh, what you want out of the cover crop, if you get uh, hard ground, you need soil compaction issues, or if you need nutrient recovery, what you're looking for. This last year in a multi-species, we used three quarters of a pound of uh, some turnips in there and uh, thought that was low enough. Well, it looks like we need to go down to about a quarter of a third a pound because turnip seed is really small. <laughs> yeah. It's really tiny and some of the others are quite large, but uh, we've had well, just, good luck with it so far. Just a quick editorial comment on the seed purchasing. So I know all of you gentlemen value getting good quality seed. So we know looking at the seed tag is important, not just buying, you said cheap seed, but we want inexpensive is good, but not yeah, necessarily the cheapest seed because we want good quality seed. We've heard some bad stories. So Buying branded varieties can be a plus and certainly working with a reputable dealer. All right, we're going to end there. This group will be out in the hall here in just a moment. And uh, we thank you very much for being here and turn yeah. it back to you.